Well, if you want to start off, so I guess today, guys, the topic is physiotherapy and tennis, um, a perfect harmony, as we like to call it so far. And uh, so would you like to start, Kasal, just by kind of introducing yourself and a little bit of background for people that don't know you? Sure. Well, first of all, Janae, thank you very much for uh, having me on your show and uh, on your webinar. Uh, you know, I totally agree. We've worked, to work well together in previous years and I've known you for a fair few years now. And um, I, I think uh, when it comes to being uh, or doing our physio work, having good coaches to work uh, side by side with uh, makes our work a lot easier. And so, uh, you know, I'm big, uh, Big, big kudos to you. So thank you for having me. Thank um, you. Uh, my background, I've been a sports physio. Well, I've been a physio now uh, for well over 20 years. I graduated from Melbourne University back in uh, 1999. I did my master's uh, in uh, 2005 or 2006 in sports physiotherapy. And um, I've only ever loved sport. It's one of the main reasons I got into physiotherapy. And, uh, you know, I've always wanted to get the best for athletes because uh, from a young age, I played all the sports. I was, you know, tennis is my second favorite sport. Cricket is my number one. <laughs> yes, yeah. Being from India, Sri Lanka, I definitely can understand. That. Yeah, I was born with the bat and ball. And, you know, but tennis is, uh, you know, my brother and I, um, he's a physio as well. So we, always used to uh, play tennis uh, whenever we got a chance and dad pushed us into that. Um, and, uh, you know, getting results for our, uh, our athletes or getting results for my athletes and getting it quickly is the key because uh, I've, I've, you know, in my career, I've worked with Olympians, Winter Olympians, uh, national level athletes. And uh, the key thing all these athletes want are results. And they don't want the results uh, later on. It's getting the best results in the shortest period of time. So that's a little bit of background on, on me as a physio. Uh, performance, uh, you know, performance is critical for me and uh, getting results. And I guess the other thing is I do lecture and consult. Uh, I've been lucky enough that the, the Australian government have asked me to take our work overseas. And, uh, you know, I've written a few books on topics such as back pain, exercise, well-being. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think I'm, I've been lucky enough that I've been able to take uh, my expertise all around the world. So it's exciting times. It is fantastic. And, you know, like uh, I've read a lot of your research and your um your background and it's, uh, it's just amazing what you're doing uh, through the university Casal. so i really thank you for um, coming on our program and sharing all your knowledge with with everyone i think it's going to be really good My so pleasure. um thanks for that so just touching on the next thing so let's talk a little bit about like why physiotherapy is important especially in today's um, world and we'll obviously um talk about tennis um so you know the game has obviously changed in the years a lot um you know people are more physical now mm. um mentally stronger people are training more on the court um the intensity is higher and also the stakes are higher in today's game um there's so many talented players and juniors out there and as you know very few make it so um, just touch a little bit about um, why physiotherapy is important for um, tennis players today at any level mm. um, and, and kind of your philosophies of, of how you approach athletes. Mm. So when it comes to tennis players and uh, or with any athlete, but in tennis, uh, it's a sport that starts from a young age. And then uh, a lot of times the athlete develops uh, through the teenage years and, you know, obviously into their 20s and that's when they become good uh, or the, you know, that's when they uh, start performing at the highest level. The importance in physiotherapy that I've seen is that we are able to one, uh, in basic terms, make sure things like flexibility. So any athlete that needs to do well, they need to have good mobility or flexibility. They need to have good control in their movements within that flexibility and range. Uh, those are the basics. After that, it's the core. And after that, it is then the strengthening and conditioning. So 
when uh, when we notice things or when we are working with tennis players, we like to screen these aspects. So screening means we're making sure that uh, the athlete uh, knows uh, or we get a baseline of uh, what's going on with them. Yep. And um, the baselines I like to use are something that are very tennis specific, which uh, I think I, I shared that uh, document with you. And uh, please pass that on to any of your um, you know, uh, attendees. So th the first is, you know, that all athletes should be aware that they, they should be screened, that they know their baseline. They know where, they, uh, where, they, where they're starting and what areas they need to improve on. Do they need to improve on flexibility uh, control? Uh, do they need to improve on things that are to do with core or strengthening and conditioning? Now, that's just the basics. After that, it's uh, looking at things that are tennis specific, uh, which are very functional, uh, you know, functional things. So um, overall, get the screen right. Uh, let's see how they develop. And, you know, it's never a straight line graph that goes up. It's, you know, improvements up and down, up and down, uh, depending on how young athletes then respond. Uh, the other thing I have noticed is what happens with, um, you know, our student, like even at the University of Melbourne, we have a lot of student athletes. Yeah. And uh, what happens during, you know, no nothing's consistent, unfortunately. There, there's other aspects of life that uh, affect how you train, uh, how the body develops, and how uh, these outside factors then um, affect uh, progress. Yeah, I think um, I think you, for me, you hit it right on the nail where you mentioned that these outside factors are really important. So you know, we train, um, and we condition, and we do all the you know the stuff tennis related, but we spend most of the time off the court. And those are the things that really come into play, especially when it's uh, small margins on the court. So we're talking about a little bit higher athletes level, um, you know, how you sleep and, you know, how you, and we'll get to this a little bit later. This is very exciting research about your, your posture. Mm. So my posture is, uh, can be a little yeah. bit better, yes. but um, <laughs> keeping that in mind, and there's some uh, really groundbreaking research that Casal would uh, present to you or touch on in the later, but um yeah, that's, that's fantastic, Kasal. And, you know, like, you know, coaching so many athletes on the tennis court and at being at the university, I've had the privilege to coach a range of different levels from, you know, never played tennis before to, to quite elite athletes. And, you know, you, you do see some, some commonalities in, in how they go about their daily activities. Mm. Um, so these are the things, I guess, that are quite important that, you know, and I've been, you know, guilty of taking for granted as well in the past. You know, these, these little things add up. And, mm. uh, you know, and, and kind of tying this a little bit into your programs that uh, Elite Academy offers, mm. you have this red, yellow and green zone that, that was very interesting when I first came upon. Mm. Could you kind of a little bit touch on, on, on what the zones mean and, and, and how we go from there? So when an athlete gets screened, uh, they know their baseline, uh, you know, they can progress from there. We work closely with the coaches then to see how to improve. Uh, once an athlete gets injured, obviously that's when the first, uh, the majority of the time athletes hear about us uh, when, they're, when they're injured. So uh, I categorize injuries in three, or I have three categories. The first one's a red zone. The red zone is where the athlete's injured. They can't do or, tr or they can't do the sport they love. They can't train and there is pain. Um, when most athletes, as the body heals, they progress from the red zone to the yellow zone. And the yellow zone is more, there's no pain. You can start training again. Is, you know, you can possibly play too. But the, 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 primary thing there the person feels the athlete feels is uh, stiffness and tightness um and that's the next one. and then it's the green zone so green zone is you're functioning really well you're playing the sport that you love you're training as well as you can and you're not really having any issues so um it's the the reason why we created this is we found it so easy to communicate with our coaches and let people know 
you know, I could say, Janaid, look, uh, this athlete is in the yellow zone. We just need to tweak a few things and uh, we will be able to get them into the uh, green zone. Or we say, look, the person's in the red zone. Uh, there's a fair few things that we need to work on. Uh, it's going to possibly take uh, X amount of time. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we then can communicate easier, which I find, and I'd probably like to get uh, your feedback on this as well, that I feel what has worked well between the two of us and our team and yours is the communication and how we, when our communication is up, uh, or very transparent, then our athlete really uh, benefits. So uh, creating that red, yellow, uh, and green zones allowed us to communicate easier, but obviously it uh, makes uh, our athlete understand their problem uh, a lot, lot more, which allows us to help uh, them quicker. Absolutely. And, and it, it definitely helped me understand um, what... Um, you guys were doing with the athlete as well in the in the physiotherapy rooms and and um, it, it, it was very clear because you know you can only push an athlete so far as, as what they're presenting to you on that day mm -hmm. so you know we, we don't as tennis coaches know necessarily what the athlete is doing last night or what they did in the morning before they came to practice so having those kind of measures in place can really tell us tennis coaches, okay, we got to take it a little bit easier on this athlete today, or, you know, this athlete's feeling good, so we can push um, him or her more. And I think that's important because that's a good um, kind of flag for injury prevention as well. Mm. Uh, we cannot always train very hard. We, we have to manage around <clears throat> niggling injuries and stuff like that. And then I think that plan for me personally, and I know I can attest for some of my athletes that it really, really helped us a lot, Kasal. So that, mm. and it's clear, the colors are clear, right? It's, it's a green, amber or yellow and, and red light. Yeah. It, it's something that we can relate to. It's, it's not going to be confusing. Mm. And um, it's, 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 it's a pro progression, as you call it. Um, mm. Yeah. That, uh, that uh, you know, traffic light system also allowed us to talk amongst our physio team uh, you know, our team is made up of physios, massage therapists. So it allowed us to talk uh, to uh, amongst us uh, quite easily as well. So uh, we find that uh, I've given it a term called the communication currency. The communication currency between all these parties are the same. And when you get that right, uh, the athletes uh, benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Very mm. good. So, so let's uh, get a little bit to the, the meat of today, as we call it. Mm. So we'll get to the, a little bit to the science. So um, that document, guys, because I'll share the document. It's, it's on our Facebook pages, social media everywhere. But uh, please contact uh, me or Kasal if you want that document. Uh, basically, it's, it's um, I have it up here. So it's a screening for tennis players. Um, so... You know, Kusal, could you kind of start off by talking about um, some of the red flags that you see in tennis players, the, the common mm. injuries and maybe why these injuries are caused? So the majority of injuries with tennis players uh, have been in the lower limb. So, you know, they're either having knee problems, ankle problems, uh, lower leg uh, muscular issues, uh, you know, hamstring tears. Uh, or Achilles problems. Um, then there's a majority of shoulder issues that arise as well. Uh, so those are the two key crack categories. And then the third category is anything spinal, uh, low back pain, uh, neck problems. Uh, and one of the reasons uh, this has come about, I feel, is because, uh, you know, tennis is such a unilateral sport. There's a lot of change in direction. Uh, so the demands on the body are very high for power, speed. Uh, so in, in essence, uh, there's always going to be some kind of breakdown in the joints uh, or the demand on the muscles. And uh, the key areas are that lower limb, uh, upper limb, which is uh, either the shoulder or elbow, uh, and then uh, the spine, which is uh, low back or the, or the neck. Um, so... You know, when it comes to the athletes screening themselves, I like to, I'd like to uh, 
get them having an understanding of what makes a good tennis player. One, they have to be fit. They have to be active. Uh, so one of the key tests we uh, recommended was like a two kilometer time trial. And, you know, it's not everyone likes running. Uh, some people are born to run, but at least two kilometers is something that you can try to achieve or you, you've got that baseline then. Yeah. So, Two, two kilometer time trial. The other uh, test that uh, I've uh, created or looked at is seeing how well an athlete runs from baseline to the net, uh, then diagonally uh, to the other net or the other side of the net, and then back to back along the baseline and come back, and uh, you know repeat that uh, six times and uh, do that in, uh, you know, you have 30 seconds to uh, do that and repeat that uh, within that 30-minute uh, cycle. Uh, sorry, 30-second cycle. And once again, it shows things like um, a, a certain level of fitness, uh, change in direction, and it gives an idea for young athletes that, well, you know, this is sort of what I'm doing. I, I, I am doing this with a certain amount of time. I've got more time. Uh, or if they're doing it well, they've got more time as a break, perhaps, and as they continue to improve. The other tests were simple things like push-ups uh, and uh, uh, crunches uh, I've put down there. Uh, push-ups, I've also created it in a way that they can do single arm push-ups, but that's against a wall because... You know, you're still trying to, most of the tests, unfortunately, if you look at things like push-ups, they're, you, you know, bilateral movements or symmetrical movements. But tennis in itself is so asymmetrical. It's so one-sided. So you, you need to get the body working uh, that way and give, having an understanding of it. Yeah, fantastic. I, I think you hit all the nails, you know, the endurance component the agility, the strengths, um, the endurance strengths. And uh, I think, you know, reading that um, research you put in place. So, guys, the reason why we probably do crunches instead of sit-ups is because sit-ups is, you know, it's, it's working that, that, that hip flexor and that pelvic area, which we don't want to test. So it's, it's kind of cheating in a sense. So crunches is a good test where um, you, can, you can time yourself over a minute um, and then see how you do. And Kusal, let's say we do these tests and, and, and people kind of log their own performance down. Mm. How often would you want your athletes to maybe retest? Uh, over a 12-week cycle, I like to test them. Uh, now, it's important, although we say 12-week cycle, we have to time it that it's not in between a major tournament or something. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'd like to say uh, during the quiet period, uh, and testing during the quiet periods just to make sure that performance levels are up. Uh, and, uh, you know, throughout the year, uh, if it's a regular athlete, if it's a, if it's a regular social athlete, doing it every 12 weeks is uh, pretty fun. And, uh, you know, you can log it yourself. And these days, uh, there's the technology uh, to monitor yourself. Uh, the other thing I would recommend for our social athletes, uh, Junaid, is for them to video any of their screenings as well. So when okay. they're doing all these tests, if they can video themselves doing the crunches, if they can video themselves doing the push-ups, the single-handed push-ups against the wall, if they can, you know, uh, potentially video themselves doing all the screening tests, um, I often find, and with the, my elite athletes, they learn a lot about themselves when they watch themselves back. Absolutely. So, um, you know, that also is uh, information that if you are injured one day, you can actually show uh, your therapist, you can show your practitioner. And sometimes it's form uh, that uh, you're looking at. I'm, I'm very big on the quality of movement. I'm very big on form. So, uh you just need to monitor that. So I'm, I'm a big fan of athletes filming themselves uh, when they're doing, even between the runs, uh, you know, you can make a very tennis specific, hold the racket while you're running. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you're just getting into, um, you're, you're getting the mind uh, ready for the sport. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that kinesthetic awareness where you can kind of look back at what you've been doing is quite important. And, you know, we as tennis coaches use that on the court quite frequently nowadays. And um, most athletes are surprised what they see. Um, you don't really, not aware of your movement and, and, and how you've been moving in the court. And usually the surprise is not so good, um, which is good in a sense because it, it gives you something to, to strive for, give you something to improve on. Yeah. Um, so I think it is very important, um, even if other people don't see the video, if you see it for yourself, um, it's very good, and especially over a 12-week time frame, many changes can happen. And, um, and usually we see the improvement um, rather than a decrease in performance over that 12-week period. Mm. But, um, no, those tests, yeah, those tests are fantastic as well. Yeah. Mm. So from a coaching perspective, Janaid, what did you think about some of those tests? And um, when I created them, you know, I wanted to make sure they were very tennis specific. So you as a coach, if you see that an athlete has done this and you can see some baseline numbers, you'd be, would you be happy with that? Absolutely. I think it's important um, to test a wide range of um, fitness levels um, on and off the tennis court because tennis is a, such a holistic sport and involves, you know, anything. Um, you, you have to be strong. You have to be able to change direction. You have to have the endurance to keep the quality and the injury prevention. Um, it, there's many tests that we do as, as tennis coaches on the court, at least I do. Um, mm. Definitely the, the short endurance test around the one and a half. So, you know, a lot of experience in the, in the US I had, we used to, used to do the uh, one mile test, which mm. is around about the 1.6K um, That's right. Mm. And, um, you know, in our college days, we had to complete it in a certain time and, and we would have kind of a, a, a frame to, to go by. So, you know, obviously that changes on the, on the level of the athlete that I am coaching. So, mm. you know, we have different expectations for beginners and intermediates advanced to elite players. Um, but there is a certain baseline that we can um, test depending on the data that we receive um, mm. over many years of testing. But um, the agility test is a great one, Cathar. That's one that we definitely use. Um, sometimes we tweak it to um, having the racket in the hand so mm. there's a little more connection to the sport. Because mm. um, players do tend to move differently with the racket in hand than without a racket in hand, as you can imagine. Um, the acceleration is, is, is not um, as good for the beginner players with the racket in hand. Mm. But uh, the elite players do tend to um, move better if they have a racket in hand just because they've had that experience. Um, but yeah, like um, in terms of the video analysis that we do, do um, I do tend to video a lot of players um, doing these fitness tests and I do send it to them. And mm. um, like you said, like these tests, they don't always have to be with a coach. They could be in the park. They could be in your backyard. Some of them don't need a lot of space. Um, but the positive thing is that we as coaches, um, we get a lot of information out of what we see. So it's really important for us to have that data and to, to give you the proper feedback for it. Um, mm. Rather than kind of just guessing, you know, this person's fast, this person's not. But um, when we have, you know, clear metrics, I think it, it makes our jobs a lot easier and it makes the feedback a lot better for you guys. Mm, yeah, definitely. I, I think, um, you know, in the screening document that I shared, uh, I've also put in things like nutrition, uh, because I feel once you get the body right, uh, the next thing body and then see how well it moves. The next thing is to see how well, uh, you know, what, what the nutrition uh, levels are of a person. And thereafter that, you know, uh, which is probably one of the big things uh, now is the mindset. Uh, you know, seeing how well uh, the mental well-being of an athlete is so crucial. So right now from the screening side, I'm noticing, well, get the physical right, get the nutrition right, and then uh, the mental well-being side as well. Yeah, absolutely. And especially in times like this, you know, when, when COVID has hit us and everyone's, you know, their lives are just turned upside down. And uh, <clears throat> So the mental challenge of uh, life, let alone sport, will be will be quite quite a big demand. And you know, there's a lot of help out there, guys. Um, Kasal has some you know experts on his team that can help you guys. Um, 
across the world, um, which is fantastic, I think. Um, so, you know, and Kusala, as you know, I'm very big on health and fitness. Mm. Um, so I think nutrition is, is a big thing. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy, guys. It's not easy to know what to eat and, and, and when to eat it. And there's so much data and research out there. You know, the fitness industry is, is very tainted nowadays. There's a lot of information on social media that's just not correct. There's no science behind it. And it's easy to kind of follow diets that don't really help performance. Um, you know, the word carbs or carbohydrates, everyone's afraid of that word, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, I cannot eat carbs. You know, I need to diet and these kind of things. But, you know, guys, tennis is an endurance sport in the end. It's... um you need to fuel your body correctly if you want to achieve your goals. And um, a lot of injuries, there's a lot of science behind injuries that are related to poor diet. Um, you know, I've seen it at a, at a high level, at a college level, that players are doing all the right things. They're training, they're sleeping well, they're doing their physio, they're doing their stretching, but they're not eating right. And mm -hmm. the body just, you know, has no fuel to work with. It cannot sustain itself. And, you know, we're not really talking about an elite level diet, you know, like uh, you don't have to be very strict. Um, you just have to make sure that you're, you know, prepared for your matches and your competition and your training. Um, mm. and then there'll be cheat meals, as we like to call it. We all love those. And those are good for the mind to you know, stimulate the sugar response and the, the glands that make you happy. Mm. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of research behind that. If you want to add anything to that, yeah. So um, I think from uh, when an athlete comes, usually comes and sees us, uh, you know, for physiotherapy, obviously we, we have the baseline tests. And um, the key things I look at are the biomechanics, uh, their flexibility. Biomechanics are made up of nerves, muscles, joints, and ligaments and any other special tests that we do. So then there's, an, uh, you know, the, getting the biomechanics. I call it the performance pyramid. So that's the base of the pyramid. On top of that is flexibility. You know, the, flexibil the flexibility needs of a, of a tennis player, you know, shoulder movements, uh, hip, knee, uh, all, the, all the spinal movements. Then it's the control that they have within um, that uh, flexibility. So it's no good having all this flexibility if the muscles aren't uh, tuned to, you know, yeah, if they don't have the quality of movement, then it becomes useless. So that's the control. On top of the control is your core. You need to have a good uh, control base or a foundation to move. And then on top of that, it's the strengthening and conditioning, which is another uh, level of expertise as well. Um, when you get this performance pyramid right, you need to then see how it works in a 24-hour cycle. So I think we just touched on this before. It's, you know, the sleep is a big factor. Uh, what happens during uh, some of our athletes at the university, they're uh, full-time students. So there's about eight hours of study uh, that they do. Uh, and then uh, potentially uh, you have another eight hours in the day, which, uh, which is sports, recreation, hobbies. So, you know, how does this uh, performance pyramid match up with that 24-hour cycle? That is sort of what physios cover. The next thing is nutrition. And this is where we have, uh, you know, wonderful uh, dietitians like Lisa Blenheim on our team who you know, screens athletes for that uh, energy intake as well. And she's a performance uh, sports dietitian. And uh, then uh, finally looking at the mind. So uh, we use this uh, questionnaire from Europe uh, that helps us ascertain, uh, you know, mindset. Um, and it allows us to see how the athlete is, you know, as a, as a whole. Uh, and then gives uh, a lot of information to one of the, the sports medicine team, but also the coaching uh, coaching side. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, especially coaching, um, as you know, we had a lot of experience with the, the university national team um, for the last couple of years. Mm. Um, you know, mix of different talents and, and personalities and, and backgrounds and experience all trying to work in harmony to, to win a national championship. And, um, 
I think looking back two years ago when we won that title and I see some of our players here, um, you know, hi to Macy and, and Belinda, if they're still with us. And uh, you know, as they can attest, um, one of the, the key elements was, um, you know, how that team combined together the, the, the structure of that team. And um, that kind of boils down to, you know, trying to do go that extra mile to do more for your teammates. You know, like get that extra hour of sleep or, you know, um, do the 1%, you know, go and get that massage with Kusal and his team and, you know, do do the warm-up properly and do the stretching after. And, you know, ins instead of going and eating that burger, you know, maybe go for the pasta, you know. These, yeah. these little things definitely um, definitely add up. And, um, and it, you know, food food is not only fuel for the body, it's fuel for the mind, isn't it? So, you know, good combining that that mental awareness of you know how am i feeling today and if i'm not feeling so good like can i do something to improve and you know mm. maybe looking looking at the training but also looking at at the diet and your mental state mm. actually Janine, you know if you can just share a little bit more about i mean that that was a huge achievement uh, for you and you know congratulations because that was two two years ago you know the men won gold and the women won gold and it was the first time uh, for the University of Melbourne for both the men and women to win gold together, was it? Is that right? Correct, uh, Correct. Uh, yeah. It's, was um, that the first time ever that we won or was that it? That was the first time that the men and women have won in the same year. So mm. the men did win once in the past when the divisions were slightly different. Um, so just in brief, because, you know, we could go about this on about this all day. It was such a shining moment. Firstly, you know, I'd like to say that, that I couldn't have done it without the, the team and, and your team. So, you know, tennis is an individual sport, but it's you have to have a good team around you. And in the past, you know, like players were doing it by themselves. There wasn't much support. So us coming in, you know, a few years ago um, with the help of, you know, the university with the help of the tennis club, with the help of each other, um, we really firstly formed a good environment for people. So if you have a good environment, you, you, you're going to flourish. You have, the chances of flourishing are more. Mm. So, you know, personally for myself, um, you know, learning how the players train and, and what they like to do. And, you know, some people like to, you know, um, train harder some people like to take it easy so it was a learning process for me because you know from my background um everything is always hard training like you train you train you train and you give everything you have so my biggest i think achievement or my proud effort was just learning the personality of the players and trying to make them be cohesive with each other um so that was i think um one of the big factors why we did succeed is that there's just the players enjoyed around being around each other. Um, they were happy to be out there. Um, their mental state, as you talked about, was, was amazing. Um, everyone had a good cohesion and then the tennis took care of itself, to be honest. Um, oh. And I think um, the players were very invested in what they were trying to do. They had a, we're all on the same page. We had the clear goal of, um, you know, winning the championship. We really, really just wanted to win it. I mean, there's always a good thing to, to go out and obviously give your best. And that's all we can ask for from coaches and from players. Um, your, your best is all you can give. But, you know, having that, that little extra, you know, we, we want to win it this year. It is, we're, we're close, but close is not good enough. We, we want to take that extra step. And I think that's kind of the the image that I try to portray to the players that I'm always there for them. Um, I believe in them that they can do it. And, you know, coming from that coaching perspective, I, I hopefully that looks like it paid off. Right. Yes. Yes, so definitely. I, it was a and tremendous. We learned a lot from the players. We learned, a, I learned a lot from the players. Mm. Yeah. It was a great thing, but um, yeah, just, you know, got a bit sidetracked there. Sorry guys, but so touching no, on this, exactly. this mental, That's great. Uh, test that you have so i'll share it with with people who want it <laughs> but basically it's it's a very simple um uh measure of your mental state so i had a mm. question for you Kusal. so there's a little kind of uh zero to hundred marker on there mm. it talks about you know how good are you feeling today out of a hundred now would we test that marker um 
would we measure that marker with how our how we're feeling today our best today or or how we want to feel in the future like how do we where is that hundred I think I think if you think of uh, just a marker saying you know hundred is the best you could ever imagine you know hundred is the best possible thing on any given day on any given day hundred is the most amazing thing you know sometimes you have days like that where you feel on top of the world and then uh, you also have those real uh, downer days so um, uh, the questionnaire which is the ecol five uh, D. Um, It's a very simple test. I think there's only six questions on it. It just tells us, you know, how you're doing uh, on in everyday life, uh, sports or activities. And then uh, they also ask you a question on anxiety, anxiety and, uh, you know, well-being and mental well-being and depression. So, you know, the more honest you are, and I think this is a key thing now uh, with uh, COVID-19 around us is, there's a lot more connection between the physical elements of the body and the mental uh, side of things as well. So uh, when it comes down to being honest with yourself, uh, that's probably the first place to start. It's very similar to, you know, there are some athletes I've had, you know, going back 10, 15 years, they'd be like, oh yeah, I've just got this hamstring issue, but I can play through the pain, Casal, you know, but sort of that bravado uh, sort of mindset. But, um, that's all well and good, but uh, you know, if you're testing against something and the tests aren't lining up, then you think, oh well, I, I better get myself sorted. So now I feel we have a lot more people having a very good understanding of mental well-being. Uh, you know, this is how I'm feeling today. You know, and taking some stock into, you know, taking stock into why that's happening potentially, and. Once again, I like to just give it like a, a you know, red, yellow or green uh, nomination and say, you know, are you in the green? Are you in the yellow? Or are you in the red? And if you have uh, a succession of days in the red, you're thinking, well, I better, I better sort something out. Something's got to change, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm. I think, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to assess yourself, isn't it? It's hard to be honest sometimes with yourself and especially with, um, you know, coaches out there. It's, you know, you always want to do, you know, hopefully do, do well for yourself, do well for your coach. So sometimes it's hard to, you know, be like, mm, maybe today I'm not really feeling it and um, mm. but I'll kind of fake it. So, yeah, these kind of things, they're, they're human nature. It's, it's hard to go against those. But that's the first step, isn't it, being honest with, you, with yourself? First being honest with yourself because, you know, it's – it's very hard to always have great days. Um, yeah, over at, at the university, we see a lot of Olympians, winter Olympians, and, you know, we, we work with them right through the year. Now the times when, and if we are monitoring them, uh, say every month and we're uh, seeing how they're going, the months around June and the months around November, we notice that our student athletes, their problems are a little bit more heightened and it's because it's the exam period. Yeah. Um, soon as there's that stress level, soon as there's stress levels uh, that uh, they experience, then it shows up in the in the physical body, in the in the physical elements. And I, I talked about the. Um, I, I think I talked. Well, I talked about the performance pyramid, and then yeah. you know the twenty four hour cycle, then the nutrition, and then the mind. How I piece it all together, and how I like to explain it is, when you get the physical elements, the biomechanics, the mobility, the control, the core, it's, it's very much like having a band. You're, you've got your band members, they're ready to play, okay? The next thing in the 24-hour cycle, if you get that right, it's about that band creating pretty good music. You can listen to them. They're, they're creating wonderful music. When you get nutrition right, it's like getting the venue right. So a band sounds amazing, when you get the venue right. So with the nutrition, you're going to get this amplification of, uh, of your performance. The mind though, the mind is like a tsunami. And what I say is the tsunami can wipe out the nutrition because sometimes, and if we use stress as, as an example, sometimes when you're very stressed, you lose appetite. 
Uh, sometimes it increases appetite uh, in different ways. Uh, it definitely affects how we sleep uh, for a lot of people. Uh, it affects concentration, focus. Uh, so that 24 hour cycle then goes out the window. And then we also know people who are stressed. All you need to tell them is, oh, you know, feel, uh, you know, the, feel your back or feel your shoulders, you know, uh, and they're like, oh, I'm so stressed. I'm so tight. Yeah. So that's why I say the mind is so important. And uh, these are some of the things uh, that I've learned over the years that are so important, even as physios. And I teach, uh, share this with all the young physios, you know, please make sure you're, you've got some kind of check or a checklist on uh, the mental well-being of your athlete, because that, that then completes it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the common saying, you can do anything you put your mind to, it's, it, it, it's definitely holds some truth, um, especially during these times. It's, it's, it's very tough. It's very tough. And um, it's, it's, it's common to get down in yourself, to think about the future, and you don't realize what stress you're putting your body through. I mean, we all stress. We, we, we can't, there's no formula where we cannot stress. But how we manage it, I think that's what we're trying to accomplish, you know, through the diet, through the awareness that we are stressed and how we're feeling, and then obviously mm. through some of the, the healing therapies. Yeah. Mm. I always like to look at stress as a, it's, it's more like an indicator that it's an area of growth for, for yourself. It could yep. be from a physical, uh, physical standpoint or even a man mental standpoint. So stress is something that is, it's like an outside factor saying, oh, hang on, just here's an area for you to work on. And uh, if you then address it, you then grow another level because then you don't have to ever worry about that again or you know how to control that situation. Yeah, yeah. And we all deal with stress differently, don't we? So, you know, some people deal with stress by eating more food or some people like to exercise or some people like to watch a movie. So mm. whatever works for you guys, do it. Um, yeah. As long as it's healthy, as long as it's positive, um, this will help back to your tennis and your performance. This will help you achieve better results and, um, you know, hopefully keep you injury free. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that's very true, Junaid, because if you look at some athletes, they might say, oh, for my fitness, I need to go on a bike or for my fitness, I need to go on a treadmill. Yeah. Um, everyone's different from a physical standpoint and mental well-being is the same thing. And uh, when, so one of the key questions I ask uh, my athletes, are, you know, is stress playing a part in your life right now? And if it is, um, if it is, what do you normally do to uh, alleviate that stress? And they might say, oh, look, I love reading or I love, uh, you know, just shutting down completely. I sleep, uh, eat or you know, all those other things that you sort of mentioned or massages and things like that that uh, really help alleviate. Yeah, and, and we would, for you guys that are viewing us, we would love to hear your thoughts on, you know, how you guys deal with stress. And, um, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to comment down there. We'll, we'll answer them towards the end. But, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. You know, personally for me, how I deal with stress is I exercise. It makes mm. me feel good. It releases the, you know, the happy hormone. And um, so every time I'm feeling down, I, you know, feel some motivation. You know, I'm a big Rafa fan. So he motivates me all the time and I watch his videos and it pumps me up and I go and exercise and yeah. you know, it's killing two birds with one stone. I'm, I'm, I'm healthy. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the work and I'm feeling better. And you know, it might be temporary. It might be not all the time, but you know, this, this is how I guess you can deal with some of the stresses um, that, that are presented to you. Yeah. Mm. yeah fantastic. So very good. So shall we, um, move on a little bit should we talk a little bit so yeah. i wanted uh, some of the viewers to know a little bit more about um obviously it's covered we can't really go many places um most of your work in the past was done you know face to face uh, just as tennis coaching but you know you've done an amazing job i think um of really connecting with people um online mm. so what i guess how have you transitioned your mindset in your business to helping people achieve these goals online now when, when we can't meet face to face. Mm. So as you know, the university is still shut. Uh, we, that's where our clinic was 
So most of our athletes were coming to the clinics, seeing us there. Uh, majority can't see us, but uh, there's always this opportunity for our athletes to, or for us to connect with our athletes through um, uh, things like uh, teleconferencing. So telehealth is a big uh, avenue. And we have used a, a program. Um, I mean, the good news is there's so much technology out there. So we, we're currently using a, a program called Telehab. It's by this wonderful company, Australian company called Vald. Um, and what we do is, uh, if it's like a tennis player, they might say, oh, Kassal, I've got this shoulder problem. Um, we will send them all the tests uh, and they're video-based tests. And we'll say, look, here are the tests that you can do. And because uh, as physios, we're always looking at movement and seeing if they're getting proper movement, we can pick up if they're doing that exercise right or wrong because they've, they're going to video themselves on those uh, exercises or the, the assessment and send it back to us. Okay. Now, all of this, we don't need to do it face-to-face. -face. And uh, they can then send that to us, we'll evaluate it, and then get on a conference call with them. Wow, and it is, it's really good. And then we uh, use uh, uh, an online program, well, Telehab, which is uh, also, it allows us to prescribe the exercises. And we would then prescribe the exercises saying, well, your shoulder problem looks like it could be coming from the neck or hang on a second, looks like it could be coming from your back. We need to then uh, exercise those areas. It's either something to do with flexibility, control, core, and, uh, you know, and I guess the other thing about the human body is it has a natural ability to heal under the right conditions. And if that's then the case, we know that, uh, so with our athletes, I touch base with them every four weeks. Uh, if, if, for example, they'd come in on that first session, uh, that I'll touch base with them every four weeks for uh, three months. So it's literally after, potentially after three sessions, uh, they're going to then have uh, a, a better improvement. So, you know, what COVID has done is allowed us to become a little bit more creative yeah. uh, with our assessments, uh, become a little bit more creative with our analysis of problems and also the prescription of uh, what we do. Uh, there is a big component as a sports physio, we, you know, we, like to use uh, the 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 hands-on element but if we can't do it we still try and get uh, very close to that and the other thing here is the research is showing that um, there's some very good results with the uh, uh, telephysio oh, fantastic yeah so as you heard it guys um, there's no reason to feel pain to suffer to get injuries and you can get a lot of a lot of help online and um one thing you know i had a little bit of experience with you kasal is this uh this human human track this human mm. movement analysis fantastic tool guys can you tell um the viewers a, a little bit about um how that can help you know, mm. some of the, yeah? so human track was also developed by vald and um human track I like to explain it, explain it as it's the MRI for human movement. So you're standing in front of a sensor, just like this, the camera, you'll be, uh, you know, moving head, moving shoulders, uh, moving your body, uh, hips, knees. And we do all these tests to see, and we will then get a complete readout. I think it's something like 20 pages, the complete readout uh, with all the graphs. Uh, with all the pictures, how that person has moved. And then as sports physios, we evaluate that information and say, oh, hang on a second. Um, these are some of the things that we didn't pick up with the naked eye. Yep. And uh, these are some of the things that we didn't pick up when we were doing our specific tests. So it's made, it's pretty much made uh, our physio work and the objectivity. So the measurements uh, are very accurate and uh, very close to then getting things like even the screening done. So um, human track, yeah, we, we've now implemented that uh, ongoing. Uh, I am consulting at uh, the Restore Movement uh, Physiotherapy Clinic in Ashwood. So when athletes then are given these programs online, they go and do that. 
but they have the capacity to come for one session, get uh, the, um, you know, this human movement MRI, get the human track done and get the full analysis. And that, uh, that as well, I like to prescribe uh, getting that done every 12 weeks. Uh, because every 12 weeks, I like to say every 12 weeks because it's like every season. You get it done once in summer, once in spring, uh, autumn and winter. Because the body changes with the seasons and uh, we, we actually, you know, work differently. Uh, the cooler months, the warmer days, you know, all of, all of those factors. Fantastic. That's a, that's a really, really good tool to have, isn't it? And um, um, yeah, and that's accessible to to people that want to use it is that still accessible yep. yeah yeah so if people want to come in for that um i do a tennis specific uh, uh, uh human track uh, screen uh and it i think what people the feedback has been that it's so comprehensive you know it's and it picks up things that they didn't even think uh that something was wrong but because it's all very objective it's very measured and you, as I said, uh, you get the graphs, you get the data and uh, you get this uh, wonderful file, you know, piece of paper saying, well, this is where you're at. Uh, and I also tell my athletes to go and show that to their coach and the, the coach then gets uh, another viewpoint. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a good leeway into, um, so, you know, one of, one of my athletes, if you remember Stephen, he did the, uh, Stephen did the test with you and, um, you know, looking at that data of, of Stephen Murphy, I don't know if he's with us today, but, um, mm. you know, we found out that actually his, when he was just standing still, that he had more forces on one leg versus the other. And, you know, it, it was not very significant, but it was significant enough to where it kind of, allowed me to link some of my lessons to why is he able to push harder in one direction to the forehand than the backhand. And, you know, mm -hmm. one of his legs were weaker. So using that kind of data, it allowed me to do some of these, these tests on him. And, uh, yeah, his left leg needed to catch up. And, um, and as you know, if one side of the body is stronger than the other, <laughs> that's prone to injuries right there. Yeah. Find the stress. So, um, yeah, these, these, these measurements, guys, really, really make a big difference. Um, and, you know, we do the work to, to read them and present the information at a, at a you know, easy level for you guys. So it's, uh, it's fantastic, this human track. And I'm looking mm. forward to using it more, actually, Casal, because, uh, yeah, I've got my own And there's, a, there's, <laughs> actually, there's actually another element. Uh, I think you, you, you were talking about even the uh, – oh, the other one was the vertical leap uh, in terms of uh, a yes. test to be done uh, – uh, Junaid, and uh, the other thing about the human track, and we're going to be implementing another thing called uh, the force decks, which is force plates. You know, how well an athlete jumps creating, uh, you know, on the force plates, we can see uh, the landing, how equal it is, uh, you know, which leg creates more force. Um, so that'll be, that'll be the uh, next level that we're uh, taking that to. That's also using uh, the technology with Vald. So I, I think the beauty of all of this is, uh, Junaid, you know, right now, for me to be a good sports physio, there's so much wonderful technology out there. So you want to try and marry that together, yeah. the, the, the knowledge base with the technology. And, you know, things become very objective, very measurable. And everyone loves to know where they're at. Uh, they want to see an improvement uh, it's, it's, uh, very much, it's kind of like driving and, you know, say you're on the freeway, you know, you're traveling at hundred kilometers an hour because your speedo tells you that. Yeah. And if you're going at 110, you think, oh, I better slow down. Or if you're at 85, you think, oh, I can go up a bit faster. So this is where for us as sports physios, you know, marrying it together with the technology allows us to communicate better with our athletes, but also, you know, continue to uh, build on uh, the athlete's performance. And when we get that right, once again, that communication currency between you, uh, the coach, me, the physio, the athlete, and also the fourth one is the administration, that the administration have a very good idea of how their athlete's doing as well. 
Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So just a little wary of the time, you can tell. So we'll just sure. try to keep moving because we've got some uh, questions. Questions here. as well, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, so it's good. So three <laughs> things, Marcel, that everyone should be doing at, at any athletic level to, to, to keep their well-being. So uh, the first thing I would recommend is... Um, First, from a physio standpoint, we do a lot of sitting. We do, uh, I talk about these sedentary postures and how bad they are. And, you know, there's that, um, the information or the research that you, me, and we're doing that with the School of Engineering at Melbourne yeah, University. Maybe, maybe another video for that one. That's we could possibly talk about that. Yeah. I mean, we're talking, we're looking at how much uh, this forward posture, this slouch posture is affecting our spines and then our leg strength and arm strength and the control. So, the first thing is I would recommend everyone to limit their sitting to 45 minutes, which means after 45 minutes, just get up for 30 seconds to a minute. They stand, walk around, and then they go and sit down again. So if they conscientiously do that, you're getting this alignment right in the spine. So one of the key reasons that or what happens is the spine moves backwards and forwards, rotates like that, and bends sideways. Um, as kids, we move our spines in all three directions. Now, as we grow older, we're only ever moving it forwards and backwards. We don't, we limit because we're on computers or doing our work. Everything is forward and, uh, and back. So because we're limited by that rotation, uh, every 45 minutes, when you get up off your chair, uh, doing 20 rotations where you're just twisting, turning side to side, twisting just to the side. And we found 20 is enough uh, to um, get everything moving because our bodies are 70% uh, fluid and we're encased in this uh, soft thing called uh, soft shell called skin. So we are meant to move. We are meant to uh, keep active. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, it's kind of like writing out a timetable for a week and saying, um, you know, I'll do three sessions of gym or three sessions working out. Uh, you know, there might be two sessions. I'll go for a walk, take, but also write in something that you might do for your mind. So if you are doing something, uh, you know, something that is of stress relief, uh, you want to write that in and you want to monitor that. So if it is two sessions of meditation, if it's two sessions writing a novel that you're doing or uh, you're doing watching your favorite TV show, but at least it's on a timetable, you know you're going to do it. And also if it's on a timetable and say you've missed two sessions, you then feel guilty that you missed it and then Correct. you'll go back to it. Go back to it. Uh, Yes. And the third thing is I, I'm a big fan of writing out a goal that you'd like to achieve in the next month. So, you know, we're first of uh, August now, I'd like to say to people, uh, you know, what, what would you like to achieve by the end of the month? Um, just make sure it's something that pushes you outside your comfort zone. It definitely helps you. And uh, that's how you're going to grow. So by keeping the body moving, you're doing things to minimize stress and then looking at one aspect that you're working on for that month, uh, you're then, your focus is more on a forward momentum and something on the, uh, on the um, positive side. Fantastic. Yeah. All great points, guys. Very yeah. good. All right, Gasol. So maybe let's talk about so three lessons you have learned from your decades as a physiotherapist three lessons three important lessons that 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 have made you grow as a person and as a physio mm. i think the first one is there's a big connect now between the human mind and the physical body and th these things i didn't realize them uh you know uh, earlier at the start of my career but as yeah. i've gone on i've seen the importance of connecting the human, uh, the, the big connection between human mind and uh, the body. The other aspect is uh, 
what I'm learning more and more is uh, the importance of being in the moment. So uh, being in the moment is having a complete understanding of my complete power right now is uh, being on this webinar with you right now. I'm not focused on anything else. Uh, and everything else that's happening is outside my control. The only control I have now is uh, you and me talking. And, yeah. you know, it, like, the, like the example of, uh, you know, uh, Instagram shutting us down for, <laughs> for a yeah. moment then, then we've got to get back on. Yeah, so um, that's probably the second component. And the third thing I've learned is um, the importance of human connection. And the human connection side, <clears throat> what uh, I feel is we, overall we have become a lot lonelier as people, although we're so connected with the technology. But we have to make ourselves accountable to keep, the, keep those connections up. Uh, very different to, you know, our grandparents, great-grandparents' time where everyone was close, talking, um, but now we have the technology to connect with friends, family. From, uh, I think we're all very lonely still. So those are sort of my learnings at the moment. Hmm. Um, Cal Thomas, Thomas uh, has a question, Kasan. He's uh, one of my ex-college teammates from the United States. So uh, hi, Thomas, if you're watching. Uh, I basically asked in um, like a better word, so how important is breakfast? So he mm. says that uh, he knows some players or athletes that don't really pay attention to breakfast or they skip it. How important is, is breakfast in, in performance? So uh, some of the latest research that we've been following, um, there was some cancer research that came out. The cancer research pretty much showed that um, these people who were about to get chemo, they went on a, uh, it was a water diet for three days before they got the chemo. And just by giving their gut a break and they ended up taking the water for three days and then they got the chemo, those people, they, the cancer actually, um, the cancer cells uh, decreased a lot faster. Um, and um, it allowed for them to recover after, it allowed them to recover after, uh, recover from the chemo a lot faster. Okay. Then people actually checked that with um, people actually checked that uh, with athletes, and they found by doing like a one day water diet was enough to allow for the gut to have a break. Uh, so we're finding that you know gut health is uh, very important uh, in terms of performance. Now, when people skip breakfast, it's a similar concept. It's a concept of fasting and it's a concept, a concept of intermittent fasting. So uh, everyone's different. Uh, some people can tolerate it. I think, once again, it's per personal preference. But that hard and fast rule of, you know, you always need to have breakfast is not true anymore. That's my experience. Okay, excellent. Hopefully, Thomas, that was good for you. And it's... it's, uh, it's um... It's something that we as tennis coaches also um, don't have a hard and fast rule. Um, and it also depends, are you playing your match in the morning? Then yes, you need to eat. Um, is it a day off? Um, are you off season? So a lot of factors come into play. Cool. Yeah. And um, so uh, Radhika, one of my clients, um, she had a question for you, Kasal. Um, so basically she said, this human track system, um, mm. Is it for only elite athletes or anybody can use it? Oh, anybody can use it. We, we recommend everybody because uh, once again, it's like uh, driving, um, driving down the freeway without a speedo. So, you know, regardless of whether you're elite or not, uh, you know, you'd love to know what your speed is. And uh, I, I recommend it for everyone. And everyone, you know, at uh, Restore Movement uh, has been loving it. Excellent, excellent. And um, she missed the question on the red, yellow, and green zones. Mm. Um, if you could just quickly summarize what, um, what you mean by those in terms of yes. screening. So every athlete uh, goes through three zones when they're injured. Red zone, completely injured. Uh, they are in pain. They can't play the sport they love and they can't train. Once they, from that level, 
uh, they improve to the yellow zone. Uh, yellow zone is uh, no pain, but it's more marked by stiffness, annoyance, um, and uh, they, they can still train, they can still play, but it's very uncomfortable still. And when healing completes, they go into the green zone, which is uh, no pain, no stiffness, and you're performing everything at the highest level. The other question I get asked, Junaid, is, you know, how, how do I know I'm healed yeah. after an injury? Uh, when you're in the green zone for four weeks, so if you're playing, training, there's, you know, there's obviously things like uh, muscle soreness after training hard, uh, uh, that kind of uh, post-training soreness. But if you can monitor that over a four-week period and you're in the green for four weeks, then you're classified as healed. Okay, that's, that's, that's excellent to know. And, and do you typically um, have people stay in the green zone or they kind of go in and out of the yellow and green? in and out of uh, green and yellow because um, you know, we, we're creatures that uh, are pushing our bodies in different ways. Uh, and a typical example is you might fall asleep on the couch. I've had athletes when, you know, the soccer world cup was on and, you know, in Australia, you're watching it late at night and, you know, they fall asleep on the couch and fall asleep funny. They're going to pull up uh, quite uncomfortable uh, the next day. And, you know, they're, uh, then pushed into the yellow, although they were fine the day before. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, would love to hear Kasal's thoughts on recovery for athletes who play consecutive games. Mm. So uh, my uh, recommendation for this is, you know, that they need to get their sleep right. Uh, we also recommend people getting in place, doing a lot more uh, you know continuous games um, wearing compression depending uh, and this is something we recommended to our athletes when at the university nationals too Janae that they sleep with their compression garments uh, and then uh, obviously getting things like the regular massages to make everything uh, relaxed yeah. and um, then uh, the nutrition side because the after continuous games, uh, you're going to use up a lot of energy uh, and then having that uh, right amount of energy going in is uh, quite crucial. Yeah, fantastic. I think mm -hmm. that sums it up really well. It's been invaluable. Obviously, you know, I've, I've been a, a big part of your, your research and your program, Casals, and you're hearing these things and get them reiterated is, is really good. Um, but yeah. I congratulate your, your team for everything you've done so far. Wonderful. No, thank you, Janaid. It's uh, always, um, I feel uh, it always makes our work a lot easier when uh, we have uh, coaches that communicate uh, so easily and, you know, that, that makes our work a lot easier. And also, um, I mean, uh, I applaud your athletes too. Uh, a lot of times, you know, they talk about our oh, Casal or the team, we, we're wonderful physios, but we're only wonderful because uh, the athletes listen to our guidance and follow through uh, with what we say. And I have to applaud your, your tennis players. And every time we've gone over for the Uni Nationals, you've chosen very solid teams to go over. And obviously that's shown in the results with the gold medal, uh, uh, gold medals and the silver medals. Yeah, um, and they're and they're wonderful athletes to work with. So I want to thank thank them all, uh, including you. Yeah, thank you. thank you, thank you. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, the the saying goes, you know, the tennis coach is, you know, just a small part of the success. It's it's the athlete that we're we're focused on. We're driven by the athlete. Um, it, it is it's it's their life. It's their performance. And we're here to, you know, to guide you and, and mm. step you on. And the rest is up to, up to you guys, you know. Um, mm. And I think, as you said, that, that national team did really, really, really well. And I think they have, you know, they'll remember this, this national championships for a long time. Yeah. yeah. Very good, guys. Thank you. Well, um, if there's no more questions, guys, just to sum up, um, so you, know, you can find, you know, myself and University of Tennis Academy. We're on Facebook, social media email and uh, Kasal is with uh, Elite Academy. Um, 
So I'll uh, send you guys that website and that link there if you want more information on some of his programs. But um, thank you, Kasal. It's been amazing. We've talked for a long time, but I've enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, hopefully, guys, we can bring some more um, exciting research to you soon, especially the one we're doing with the University of Melbourne Engineering Department. So there will be some videos coming your way, and uh, it is groundbreaking research. It's um, one of the world's first. Mm. It's very proud to be part of that, Kasal. Thank you. No, thank you, Janine. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Take care. We'll speak to you soon. All right. Take care. Bye. Thanks, guys. See you.